Take your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you would. We're going to pick up where we left off this morning in our study of this book by talking about the God-given increase. Now, this morning, Brother West mentioned that Paul was rebuking the Corinthian church for their carnality. And their carnality, their fleshliness, their worldliness was leading to a major problem in the church. It was leading to divisions in the church. Uh, there was strifes and envyings and, envyings and those types of things. And, and their carnality leads to their division within the church. And by the way, let me say this. Carnality in the church will always lead to division. Always. That's why we have to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and fulfill the lust thereof, but walk after the spirit of God so that we can be of one mind and one body and be unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus prayed for this. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed that all of his people might be in the same bond of oneness as he and his father were and what they enjoyed. But Satan's strategy is and has always been to turn the church against itself. Jesus himself said that a house that is divided against itself cannot what? Cannot stand. It's going to fall. That principle applies to us as a church. And if Satan, Satan doesn't have to destroy the church, Satan only has to create division in the church, and the church will destroy itself. I've seen it happen many times in my short lifespan. I've seen churches divide against themselves and they, they quarrel and they fight and they have these divisions and, and then one church goes over here and starts a church called Unity and the other part goes over here and starts a church called Harmony, right? It happens. And that's been his plan all along. But occasionally, occasionally we get a glimpse of the oneness that God can see in the church. Occasionally, we see it, and someday it will dis be displayed for all the universe to see and throughout all eternity, and Satan cannot destroy the oneness of God's people in eternity. Now, but here in our text, there is still a matter of divisions, and they're divided, they're divided over who they're following and who their leadership is. And if you went back uh, to chapter 1, you see this is an ongoing issue. It isn't something new. He mentions it in chapter 1. In verse 12 and verse 13, he said, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. And then he says in verse 13 of chapter 1, he said, Is Christ divided? Uh, was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, no, none of these things uh, are going to create unity. They're only creating division. So it's an ongoing issue. And he mentions it again here in chapter 3. Begin with me in verse 4. Let's look at verse 4. We'll read down uh, to verse 8. Paul says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? And there's that word again, your carnality, your, your fleshliness, your worldliness. He says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And I love verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, and neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, that's important to know, too, isn't it? Let's just stop right there. You might underscore those, those last few lines there in your scriptures because those are going to be important. We'll get to those in the end. But let's, let's go back to verse 4, and let's begin right there, first of all, with the question of reality. What you're seeing in verse 4 and verse 5 is what we would call a reality check. He's, he's showing us something that maybe we don't want to realize that that in the end, these men who are highly esteemed are just that. They are men. You ever have a reality check where someone has to bring you back down uh, to earth? We mean, you're getting a little too lofty on yourself. You know, Paul, Paul understood this very well. In fact, he expressed it. He expressed it very well in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul said this of himself. 
he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given to me, he said, uh, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul understood something. He understood that he was just a vessel and that he couldn't get too high on himself and we can't get too high on other people. He said, so lest I should be exalted above measure. I was given this thorn in the flesh that brings me back down. Those are called reality checks. You ever had one? Uh, when someone brings you right back to earth, you're flying high and things are going well and, and people are patting you on the back and things are going great and then someone comes along and tells you the truth about yourself and they bring you right back down. I remember not too long ago I got a, a reality check. Uh, you see, I didn't realize that I was losing my hair. Uh, people told me that when I pray and you're out in the lobby and you see the TV and I'm praying they said you can really tell them but I didn't know I was unaware and I came in one day dressed up nice looking good got my tie cinched up feeling pretty good about how I looked and I bent over I got down in my recliner bent over to tie my shoe and my daughter said oh daddy this is Leah she was about five she said daddy you got a terrible haircut they have, they have shaved you plumb down on the top right up here. And I said, well, I'll take care of that. I'll go somewhere else. They keep doing that. I was feeling pretty good about how I looked until I bent over to tie my shoe, and Leah brought me right back down to earth. You know, that's, those are reality checks. And, and those happen in our lives. And here he confronts to them a question of reality. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? They're just ministers by whom you believe. That's all they are. And there, there's not much difference in them. They're just servants. They're just vessels. They're just tools in the hands of God is what they are. And there's a bit of reality here. Notice the men. First of all, the men involved in this. Who are these men? Even Paul himself, but servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Corinthians preferred one preacher above the other. But Paul says that God simply is using those men as instruments to bring the conversion of other people about. You know, and it's, it's the same today. We all have preferences. We all have people that we enjoy to listen to. I have my favorite preacher. You have your favorite preacher. And we have people that we enjoy, we look up to, that we follow after. We read their books. We listen to their podcasts. But in the end, the reality of it all is that they're just instruments. They're just instruments like you and like me who are used to bring about the conversion of other people and, and, to, and to spread the seed of God and to water the seed of God. They all have different gifts, but they have the same grace. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. We all have different gifts. Now here's the question. What would heaven be like if these kind of contentions were carried over to heaven? Could you imagine what that would be like? Uh, people sitting around uh, boasting and boosting of other people in their lives and, and talking about how great D.L. Moody is and, and how great Charles Spurgeon was and, and bragging about Billy Graham or Adrian Rogers and, and John Rice and all, oh, but I really loved Brother Matt and I really loved Pastor West. And it just goes on and on and on and on. Could you imagine if heaven was like that? But who are these men? And we all have them. They're just instruments. They're just instruments. And, and really, they're not really any more important than you are. Maybe they're just more involved than you are. And that's comforting to me because I think about some of these men and I hold them in high esteem, but they're just instruments of God like I am. Think about the ministry involved here. Uh, Paul urges in the face the facts about the division that they're having, the, the quarrel that they're having about these different men. That men, even the most illustrious of men, are only men, though they might have different backgrounds, though they might have different gifts to use in the ministry. You know, men can be different and still complement each other. Do you know that? It's just like in your marriage. A husband and wife don't have to be just alike to complement each other. My wife and I go together very well. If you looked at Pastor West and I, he and I are very different. Good cop, bad cop, right? 
You know, we're, I've had people say, you and Pastor West are so different from each other, yet you compliment each other very well. He, he's taught me a lot of things about leadership, about organization. I've taught him how to laugh and how to cut up and cut jokes. We've, we've helped each other. Then you look at our marriages. He's married to a woman who acts just like me. And I'm married to a woman who acts just like him. The four of us get in the car together. Him and Kara stare at each other, and me and Betty fight for words. You don't have to be twins to be brothers. People are different. They compliment each other. If Kara talked as much as I did, we would never get along. Paul and Apollos were different. They think about their backgrounds. Paul came from a pharisaical background, didn't he? He was trained as a rabbi. He was a pupil of uh, the illustrious Gamaliel. He grew up among the, the Hellenist Jews in Tarsus. He, was, uh, he prized his invaluable asset of being a Roman citizen. He was well-versed in rabbinical law, and he was, uh, he was a man who understood Greek philosophy. He was a man who was very... Uh, avid about his persecution of the church, yet when he met Jesus in Acts chapter 9 and had his Damascus Road experience, changed his life, and he became somebody who was the foremost missionary of the New Testament church. He became a theologian. He became the spokesman of the church. He became the man who wrote 14 of the 27 books in your New Testament that we still read today, and he still lifted up high today. That's who he was. And then you have Apollos, who by contrast grew up in Alexandria, which had a large Jewish community. They enjoyed a lot of considerable self-government. They had a lot of influence, a lot of power. Phileo's brother, Alexander, was not only chief of customs officer, he was fabulously wealthy. Philo himself was a patriotic Jew. He was somebody who, uh, who developed a system of hermeneutics that was used to uh, allegorize and to interpret the, the Old Testament scriptures and maybe even to the point that they'd be seen to be absurd to some degree. He used uh, philosophy, Greek philosophy, to try to allegorize the, the Old Testament scriptures. Apollos was an Alexandrian. It would have been hard for Apollos to escape the influence of Philo. He, he probably held to his type of teaching of taking the Old Testament scriptures and, and making them into allegory. And, and that probably didn't sit well with Paul. I'm sure there was a contrast in the way that they saw things. And he had a great understanding of the Old Testament scriptures, even though he himself struggled in understanding the gospel. Because you remember he was taken aside and taught more perfectly the things concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ later on. So here are two different men from two different backgrounds, two different styles of preaching. It's very likely that Apollos favored uh, Philo's allegorical hermeneutics, and Paul and Apollos were both great and both gifted, yet they were only servants that God was using to work out his, his kingdom work. They're both different, both gifted differently. Both saw things probably differently. Probably both had different approaches to the same thing. You ever heard the expression, there's more than one way to skin a cat? Yet they probably complemented each other very well. The reality of all of this is that these were both men involved in the ministry of God. And both of these men had a job to do. Now listen, you can be different than me. And we need you to be. And I need to be different than you. But we both have a job to do. You have a job to do for Christ, and I have a job to do for Christ, and we don't have to be just like each other to be used of God. We just have to be available and usable. Amen? Notice, secondly, the question of results here. That's the reality of it all, is that there are two men doing God's work. Not one was better than the other. They're both instruments that God was using. But here's the question of results in verses 6 and in verse 7, he said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but here you go, but God gave the increase. 
Now look at the appeal here. What is the appeal of all this? The appeal is to unity. Paul's trying to create unity in the church at Corinth by appealing to them in the sense that, listen, uh, you're not better than me, and I'm not better than him, he's not better than you. We're working together, I plant, he waters, God gives the increase. Now we do not know what Paul may have thought about Alexandrian Christianity, which certainly seems to be somewhat defective. But you know, Paul never put Apollos down. He didn't put him down. He said, Apollos is doing his job, I'll do my job, and then we'll let God do the job that only God can do. When it comes to unity in the church, you have a job to do. And I have a job to do. You may not do your job the way that I would have done it. That does not give me the right to come and tell you how you ought to do your job. Just because you didn't do it the way that I would do it. I, I've heard people in churches squabble over how they cut the donuts up and set them out on the table out in the lobby. Well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I'd have cut them in fourths instead of halves. And I just want to say, really? Just because you do your job different than I would do it doesn't mean I need to put you down. We never read that Paul put him down. The appeal from Paul was for unity. Yes, he's different than me. And yes, I may not even like the background which he came from. And yes, he didn't have a great understanding of the gospel. He did his job. I planted. He watered. God gave the increase. One did it this way. One does it that way. But the point was, the appeal was, we're all on the same side. Boy, if we could get Christians to understand that. Amen. We're on the same team. Some people don't understand that. All they have is criticisms for others. When John on one occasion said to the Lord Jesus, he said, Master, we saw, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. This is in Mark chapter 9. And he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. And Jesus replied this, he said, Forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. I, one time I had a guy come to my door from another church in this town. And he began to talk to me about his church and about things. And he was witnessing to me. I, did, I don't tell people right off the bat that I am a Christian or that I'm a pastor. I let him figure it out. So I let him witness to me for a little while, and I'm answering his questions. And there was three of them. It was a man and an older woman and a young girl. The young girl didn't say anything. She just kind of stood back. She must have been learning. But he's asking me questions, and I'm just answering his questions. And you can see the delight on his face as I'm answering all the questions for him. Pretty soon he says, you're, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. I said, in fact, I said, uh, I'm a pastor here in town. He said, oh, really? And then he, went to, he, he switched gears on me. He went from this friendly guy trying to share Jesus with me to this guy that was going to examine my faith. Well, tell me what you think about people like me. And I said, well, I don't know much about you. He said, people like me who believe in, in certain things, and he mentioned some things. He said, our church believes in this, and I know your church doesn't believe in that. Now, how do you think that conversation is going to end? I saw one person back and go. Like, come here. I said, well, I said, let me, let me do this. I, for once, I exercise wisdom. And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah. I said, do you believe that he died on the cross to pay our sin debt and that his blood covers our sin? He said, yes. I said, do you believe that he's the only way to heaven? It's not of our works, but faith in Christ, Christ alone. I said, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He said, I sure have. I said, as far as I can tell, we're brothers, but we're not twins. He's not like me. And there was no, there was no unity going to come from us talking about our differences and our beliefs. So it wasn't going to be any productivity happening there. I don't have to be like him to be his brother. I think we're going to be surprised someday. Uh, he, he may not be 
uh, on my team as far as my religious beliefs, but he's on my team as far as the kingdom of heaven, as far as I can tell. If he's not against me, he must be on my part. If he's out sharing that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, and if you trust in him as your Lord and Savior, you can go to heaven, then listen, I, I'm not going to rebuke him, though we're different. So Paul saw Apollos as a partner and not a rival. And sometimes people will do that to you. Listen, hey, church members will do this to you. They'll pit you against other preachers. They will. I went and preached a revival one time. Young preacher was the pastor. Hadn't been there very long at all at a church that was on its way out and dying and not doing well at all. I went to preach a revival, and he's standing beside me here as we're shaking hands, and, and people are coming out saying, boy, I sure wish that you would teach him how to preach. I sure wish he was like you. I sure wish that. I said, boy, I'm glad he's not like me. So I got up and said, you ought to love your pastor. You know, not everybody in the world wants to come here and pastor your church. You ought to be thankful that he was so ignorant that he took the job. Do you know that they fired him? They fired him right after I left and then had the audacity to call me and ask me if I was interested in being their pastor. I said, I saw how you treated your pastor. Thank you, but no thank you. They'll pit you against each other. Listen, this is not a competition. I'm not here to try to be better than Brother West. My mother, if she was here, she said, well, you can try for 30 more years and you still won't be better than Brother West, is what she would say. That's not my job. It's not his job to be like me. It's, we're not a rivalry. We are a partnership. We're not all gifted to plow and to plant. We don't all have the patience and concern to water. Our job is to do what God has called us to do and do it together as a team. That's the appeal. Number two, look at the application in verse 7. I love verse 7. He goes on to discredit those people who work in the field. Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. Uh, the, the seed was sown. That's a simple operation. You know what? You know how they sowed seeds back in this day? They broadcast it. They would take a pouch or flap over a, a garment and put seed in it, and they would just walk about broadcasting the seed. It really isn't that hard. It doesn't take a genius to grab a handful of seed and fling it out there. I've done it. I've plowed up field and broadcasted out seed to, to, to uh, grow uh, food plots for deer. And they just walk out through there. Even somebody as uneducated as I am can grab a bag of seed and go, whoosh, whoosh. nothing special about that guy. You know, watering the seed was not much different. They have a channel. Water comes down through. If the, if the farmer wants to redirect the water, he does this right here. Plow, he just kind of dams up a little bit of that channel, and he goes over here, takes his foot, moves a little bit of dirt, water comes over here. Well, that's real hard, wasn't it? Take somebody special to do that. Take somebody special to do this, to do this, to water, and to, and to cast a little seed. No. The application is the people who are doing these things right here, they're not really much of anything. It doesn't take much of it. There's no reason to put Paul up here. No reason to put Apollos up here. All they did was plant and water. It was God who gave the increase. It was God who did the, the hard work. Broadcasting isn't that hard. Anybody could do that. Anybody can go out. Listen, it doesn't take a great deal of effort for you to broadcast the Word of God. It really doesn't. It doesn't take a lot of effort to share a, a verse of Scripture with somebody. It doesn't take a lot of effort to share a smile, a smile with somebody. It doesn't take a lot of effort to give them a hug or a word of encouragement. That's just sowing some seed there. Come along and water it with a smile and a hug. The hard part came after that, the mysterious part. The impossible part where the seed germinated, where there... Life comes and roots take place in the moist soil and tiny green spouts begin to show up above the ground and, and a miracle is taking place that has no explanation aside from God is doing this. There's life in this growth and these, these shoots become stems and stems produce a, a wonderful fragrant thing and, and, and colors and beautiful flowers and then the bees come along and they pollinate and they transfer pollen Fruit appears, a miracle happens that we call nature that, we, that happens so often around us we tend to take it for granted. 
We call it nature, but really it's God doing what only God can do. And we don't understand exactly how it all works. And we don't know exactly how it works in the heart of people. But when we plant the seeds of the word of God and when we water that and we cultivate that with love and grace and mercy, God can do the hard part. He can work the miracle of germinating the seed of his word in the hearts of people and he can bring life where there was no life in somebody we don't understand how that works and Paul says listen all I did was plant the seed of God's word and we know that the seed is God's word by Matthew 13 when you look at the parable it's not money like Benny Hinn would say that you you sprinkle that money and it gets bigger and better that'd be great if it was it's the word of God Paul said, I, I, I put out the word of God. Apollos, he comes along, he waters that word, and then God does something. He does a mysterious thing. He brings life. He germinates a new life into the human heart. 1 Peter 1, 23 says it this way in 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, there's that seed, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. You say, how does it happen? I don't know. That's what makes it so great. God knows how it happens. It's just like when Nicodemus came to Jesus about the great mystery of being born again. And he asked Jesus. And Jesus said, well, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. How can I be born when I'm old? Can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? You know, he said in John 3, 8, he says, Thou canst not tell how this happened. You just can't tell. Nicodemus may have been a learned doctor, yet he didn't have the slightest idea about how spiritual life is germinated in the human soul, and neither do we. Paul recognized the whole mysterious process of conviction, conversion, consecration, with all the ramifications of election, justification, sanctification, atonement, redemption, reconciliation, regeneration, and one day glorification. It's all a mystery. It's all a mystery. All of that stuff is the work of God. He that planteth is nothing. And he that watereth is nothing, but it is God who gives the increase. That's the mystery of it all. You know, so often, I think so often we are deterred in our work for God because we're concerned about the harvest. But here, here's the thing. We're not responsible for the harvest. You can't give the harvest. I can't give the harvest. All I can do is plant and water. That's it. I do know this, without planting, without watering, there will be no harvest. I do know that. And many churches across America are bearing that truth out right now. There's been no planting in their church. There's been no watering in their churches dying. There's been no harvest. But I also know this, that my, my job is not to harvest. My job is to plant the seed and water. And what that does for me, it takes a huge load off of my shoulders. Because when I read here, it says, he that planteth and he that watereth is nothing. It's not up to me. Now, we are going to give an answer. We're going to give an answer, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But right now, we don't know how this happens. Our job is to plant and water. And then, here's what happens. When the harvest comes, and it, and it had nothing to do with you other than you planted the seed and you watered, God gave the increase, then who gets the glory? God does. That's why he said in chapter 1 and verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence. Because we didn't do anything. All we did was throw a little seed and direct the water to it. That's it. There's no glory on my part. All glory goes to God. Let's look at one last thing here. Look at the question of rewards. The question of rewards in verse 8. 
He said, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. They're, they're together, unified. There's no division. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, I want you to look in that verse and look at these two words, his own. His own reward, and then right below that in my Bible, it says his own labor. Now, if you are inclined to write in your Bible, you might underscore those two little words, his own and his own. Now, Paul follows all this up by raising the question of rewards. He calls, first of all, for perfect accord in the body. Perfect accord in the body of Christ. He said, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. It's, it's not a question of rivalry. It's a question of unity. We all have different gifts, different abilities, and different tasks. And, and listen, friends, here's one thing we don't have in all of this we don't have time to waste with quarreling, especially over things so trivial as who is your favorite pastor when it's clearly Pastor West. All right? Don't even pretend. He's the good cop. We know it. I mean, what a silly thing. Can you imagine, though, can you imagine having to stand before God and explain some of the silly church arguments you've been involved in or witnessed in your life? Can you imagine what that's going? how humiliating that is going to be? We don't have time for that. There's no time. There has to be unity. The Holy Spirit is the Lord of the harvest. And there are few enough in churches today who are willing to labor. We cannot afford to be fighting among ourselves or raiding another man's field or, or pushing for recognition or position in life. We are to come alongside one another and pull together for the kingdom's work and for the honor and glory of God. We ought to be one when it comes to evangelizing this lost world. There is to be perfect accord in the body. Secondly, he talks about personal acclaim at the Bema. The Bema seat is the judgment seat of Christ that we're going to stand at. We're going to stand there. And notice what he says here. I know this is the part where everybody zips their Bible because we're at that last line. But don't leave me yet. Okay? He says something very important here that we need to hear before we zip up. He says, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, I, that's important because there's an emphasis on his own. Now, there may have been divisions in this church. He calls for unity. We are to be one body in Christ. Amen? But when we stand in judgment, you are going to stand alone. You're going to stand by yourself. You cannot stand there next to Pastor West and go, well... He was my pastor for 20, 30, 40 years, however long you were here. And he did a lot of great things. That ain't going to work. You can't stand next to one of the deacons and say, well, you know, they did all this service for all these years. You can't stand next to one of the Gideons and say, well, they did prison ministry, handed out Bibles all over the globe. You can't stand next to them. You're going to stand there, and I'm going to stand there before God, and we're going to stand on our own in our own work. And for the first time, we're going to be exposed for who we really are and what we've really done. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but it kind of frightens me. You know, and people say, well, Brother Matt, that's a poor motive. Rewards are a poor motive for serving God. Oh, are they now? Since you're so pious, you can explain these other verses in here. The Bible tells us that rewards are very much a good motivational tool for serving. He goes on here to say that uh, we shall receive our reward according to our labor, not somebody else's. Look at verses 13 and 14 of this chapter. He said, every man's work shall be made manifest. You know what that means, right? To be made to appear. Are you ready? Let me ask you a question. Are you ready 
for your work to be displayed. You ever work on a project and someone comes in and you say, no, 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 don't look yet. It's not ready. Wait till I'm done. I'll, I'll reveal the final product when I'm done. Or a painting. Maybe you're doing a painting. For me, it's when my wife says, you know, I need you to do some laundry. And she comes in the room and I've been watching ESPN. I'm like, no, 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 not yet. I'm not ready. I'm still folding. Don't look. And you really haven't started. There's going to come a day of true honesty before God. Think about it. When your works are going to be made manifest, and it says here that the day will declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Now think about that for a second. Your work, your works here for Christ are going to pass through the fire of his judgment. And the fire shall try every man's work of what it is, what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereon, he shall what? Receive a reward. Listen, rewards are good. We should work because we love the Lord. But the Lord gives us these incentives as well that he's going to reward us. Now, I've had people tell me. I've had people tell me, oh, brother, man, I, I'm not working for rewards. I don't care if I get any rewards. I just want to get, I just want to get into the edge of heaven. I, I don't have to be on the front row of heaven. I say, well, you must be a Baptist. Nobody wants to be on the front row of anything around here. I don't have to be in the front row. I just want to be in heaven. And I don't have to have a mansion. Just give me a little cabin in the corner of glory. Well, I got news for you. According to these passages, there are going to be some people who get into heaven with their, their, uh, their shirt tail smoking. They're going, to, they're going to get to heaven. They're going to suffer loss, though. They're going to suffer loss. Not the loss of their salvation, but loss of rewards. But let me tell you this, though. You're going to want rewards when you get there. I had a lady tell me this not too long ago. She said, well, I don't want any rewards. I'm not really interested in all of that. I said, is that a fact? I said, you ever gone to a party? You've been invited to a dinner party, and you didn't have anything in hand to take to the dinner party? I said, do you ever feel bad when you showed up and you didn't have anything to offer to the party? She said, oh, yeah. You drove past three Walmarts, didn't stop and get one pie. I said, how would you feel? She said, oh, I'd feel awful. I just showed up with nothing. And here I am to eat, and I didn't bring anything. I didn't contribute anything to this. I said, imagine how you're going to feel someday when you stand before the Lord of glory and you have nothing to offer him. According to the scriptures, we're going to take our rewards and we're going to have an opportunity to offer them back to him, to cast them at his feet. And listen, friends, how embarrassing is it going to be to show up with nothing? Think about that. Must I go and empty-handed? Thus my blessed Savior meet. Remember that old song? We don't want that. The question of rewards. You can't ride your grandpa's skirt tail. You can't ride your church's skirt tail. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, if you're still not convinced, let me share some words with you as I get ready to close. Words that you're very familiar with, but Paul, closing out his thoughts to Timothy, he says this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, not the good fight, a good fight, his fight. I have finished my course, not the course, his course. You have a course, you have a fight. He had a course, he had a fight. You have one too. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You're going to want reward. And we're not to covet nor criticize another man's work or his field. We are to just simply faithfully cultivate our own work and do what God's called us to do, run the race that is set before us. I believe it was D.L. Moody who was criticized by a lady for the way that he did evangelism. And she said, you know, I don't really care for the way that you do it. 
he said, well, tell me, how do you do it? She said, well, I, I don't really do evangelism. He said, well, I like the way that I do it better than the way that you don't do it. Amen? Are you doing it? Are you sharing the word of God? Are you being used in the end time harvest? I'm going to have Brother Sam come and our musicians come. We're going to close. We have a very simple task. And that task is this. Come together in unity and harmony. Spread the seed of God's word and water it somehow. You know, seeds are being planted everywhere. Sometimes all it would take for you or for me would be to just come along and water that seed. Maybe just fertilize it a little bit. Maybe, maybe, maybe water it with a smile, with a word of encouragement instead of a word of judgment. Maybe just to come along and put an arm around somebody and say, you know what, I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm praying for you, and I'm here for you if you need me. Our job is the easy job. Preach the word and water. God, God will give the increase. Here's one thing I do know. God is faithful, amen? He always has been, he always will be. And if we will be faithful to do our part, God will be faithful to do his part. If we'll be faithful to share the word of God, he'll give the increase. I remember the first church I pastored, First Sunday I was there was seven members, but the first Sunday I was there was only five there. We had two, two out on vacation. You got seven members, two of them leave. It hurts, you know. It's like okay, that was my first Sunday. I was 25 years old. I didn't know come here from Sikkim, but I did know this that God was faithful. And I had a guy tell me, my, my former pastor told me, he said, God faithfully rewards our efforts. So that's what I did. I got out in my little community, and I knocked on doors, and, and I knocked on doors, knocked on doors. My greatest fear was that people might actually come to church and realize I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was scared to death, and I got up and preached every Sunday and Sunday night, and it was a blur. And I remember one week I went out, and I killed myself knocking on doors. Knocking, I made up some really nice pamphlets and our church name and, and I had all these people give me these promises and you, that's never happened y'all people promise you they're coming to church they're not and I used to stand at the front door like a little kid looking for them they're not coming just go ahead and get your nose off the glass <laughs> they're coming and that week I had all these people promise me they're going to come well in a church of seven people when you have 11 first time visitors that's like Easter, like, like an Easter Sunday. And we had grown up to about 20, and that day we had 11 first-time visitors come in. Only two were people that I had spoken to. Only two. And I was like, where did all these people come from? I don't even know you. I didn't even meet you guys. And then it dawned on me. God rewards our effort. It may not be the people you talk to. But God will send somebody else. I can't tell you how many people Pastor West and I have talked to who I thought would for sure would be here on Sunday. And they're not, but they, God always sends someone else. Let me ask you this. Why would God send someone to a church that isn't doing what he's asking them to do? That's a good question. Why would he? If a church is not healthy and a church is not serving and not planting and watering the seed of God. Why would God send people here? I wouldn't if I was God. But if a church is faithful to preach his word and to share it outside these walls, God will give the increase every time he's faithful. And maybe you're here tonight and you've never been brought in as part of the harvest of God's loved ones and the seed's being planted in your heart. The gospel that Jesus Christ loves you, he died for your sins, he rose again, and that he would save you if you would just turn loose, turn from your sin and trust in him. Tonight, that seed's been planted in your heart. I know it. Let me water it. And let me just tell you that God is here with open arms to receive you for salvation. 
and to make you part of his great harvest if you would just give yourself to him.